how to live. You have a long list of jobs in your career before you're an entrepreneur, um, including a camp counselor in the US and a nanny in France. But I'm sure you're not surprised that the one that did catch our eye was that you were a stewardess on David Bowie's yacht. Yeah, yeah. Look, oh, look, I was a, a absolutely broke 21 year old cru- cru- cruising around the world. Arrived in France with literally 200 francs to my name, which equivalent of about 40 bucks. Mm-hmm. And that was it. I had cash my ticket home because that's what you do when you're a smart 21 year old. And you and the other thing I did was I had about two grand worth of credit card debt and I had nothing, nowhere to live, nothing. And so, yeah, a friend of mine had a boat. So I basically punked into a boat. And um, then I found, I heard a, about there was a job in a place called Villeneuve Le Bay. And so I took my way into a stewardess yacht in the south of France and six weeks later Bowie bought it so yeah for the next two years yeah hung out with rock stars and movie stars oh my no goodness so way. you're literally on the boat that he owns yeah were you a fan yeah I mean who wasn't a fan of Bowie you know he I mean I'm his music was sort of instrumental in my upbringing and you know whether it's Space Oddity or you know his Sticky Stardust days or his you know duos with J- Jagger and yeah so it was insane oh my gosh amazing we actually watch a reality tv show called Below Deck um, and that features like the lives, the like crazy dramatic lives of people working on yachts in the south of France. And so I'm just like imagining all these crazy things happening in the midst of David Bowie, which would just be next level. And was he in costume every day? No, no. Uh, look, he was 42 okay. by that stage. So he had a son called Joe, uh, who was about 17. And uh, he, he was actually, I think he's, you know, um, crazy, crazy days. Not that we're behind him because he was a cr- massive creative. But his, um, there was no sex, drugs and rock and roll. There okay. was, um, you know, there was, you know, some drinking. But he was just, you know, pretty low key. But, you know, he, he used to hang out with Jagger and we'd go to the island of Mustique. And Mustique had, you know, um, Princess Margaret there and Jagger and a few others that they had parties with. And, yeah, it was just funny. Jerry That's Hall. so Gosh. cool. I could not keep my shit together in that situation. I'd just be like losing it every time. Like, okay, Mr. Bowie. <laughs> I think it's funny. When you're there, you, you have the first reaction of, oh, my God, it's him. And then you normalize yeah yeah and then um and then i remember one time i was i don't know doing something in the galley and um he was warming up he was doing a a a, a piece he was warming up his vocals because he created a brand band called tin machine and with him while he was warming up his vocals to start his tin machine he sang space, space oddity and that was the first time i went oh my god i've worked for a year I went, oh my god that's david bowie <laughs> like, <laughs> like before then you just yeah yeah just a normal it's a person. person yeah it's a person you know yeah, that's, that's the thing true. at the end of the day like everyone's just a human so like once you get past that fame it's like oh i'm a person you're a person correct you know and, and you know we, we grow up we, as young girls thinking that there's you know us norm- mortals and then there's a superhuman right and the superhuman are any celebrity that you sort of look at and go oh my god clearly they are superhuman we're just normal and you treat them as such and I think what was great for me in, in a year when I was 21 is to realise that people were people and that, you know what, he had the same fears, the fa- same problems, the fa- same highs, same lows as anyone else in any part of the world. And I think it really helped me get into business to not feel like I was better or worse than someone else. Mm. So despite the fact that, you know, I left school at 16 and didn't do a uni degree, I didn't feel less than a lawyer that, it was, that I'd hired or an accountant or someone that had other form of education I just was there for my for my purpose so yeah totally yeah that's actually something that like we love to kind of show people through the podcast is like you know people often have feel fears around like putting themselves out there because they're like why me like someone else is better at it but it's like no we all kind of have these fears like no matter how kind of accomplished you are I guess you still have these little things about yourself that you would change or feel insecure about and so it's like just get up and do it. Well, the mind's so powerful. You can create whatever life you want. You've just got to think about first who you are. You know, we, we do things like, oh, I want to be successful. I want to have more money. I want to have a, a love. I want, I want, I want. Now, if you continue your life with that want, that's what you'll get in life. You'll get the what feeling of wanting. Mm-hmm. But if you then convert what you say and then say, I am going to get up at six o'clock and when I get up at six o'clock, I am, I am, I am, suddenly you change how you think. Like I am a person that eats healthy. I am a person that does yoga every day. I don't want to do yoga every day because if that's the case, I'll get the feeling of wanting. Mm. So it's just changing the mindset. And when you 
most of people's stresses come from manifesting what could possibly go wrong in the future right we all do it right god you know my son's gone out to get run over you know like you totally you, that you, fortune telling mentality yeah. of worrying about something that might happen Correct. in the future instead of living now and we get really stressed about it but the reality is you know the, there's a really simple way to deal with it can you do something about it no then don't worry about it if you can do something about it yes then do something about it so it's a really simple thing but it, it really we really do have to change the way because in actual fact stress is the biggest killer Yet stress is manifested in our brain. It's not real. Mm. Janine, I had to be in therapy for like four years before I <laughs> learned that. And you just like smashed it out in the first four minutes. <laughs> Great. Well, hopefully we've fast tracked some <laughs> other people's journeys now. So you don't, don't worry about booking in that therapy session. And actually, I've been listening to a lot of Brene Brown recently. Love her. And she talks a lot about like that fear that we have um, and like worst case scenarios. And that like actually through her study, she's found that through gratitude, when you feel that like pang of vulnerability and you're like going to go into like doomsday mode, going into gratitude instead and being like, oh, I'm grateful for my life. I'm grateful for my my sister not worried about her. That's when you kind of you know you shift that mentality and you can think about it in a different way it's powerful gratefulness is powerful and if you do it if you sort of had a grateful a grateful ritual every day it's amazing how you think think differently like for example um you know you might be stuck in traffic right and you go oh god you know you whinge and you carry on that person but you're grateful that you got a car or you're grateful that you're actually going to get there or you're grateful that you actually arrived safely. You can actually, you can either be negatively biased or positively biased. And the if you are positively biased, you see the good thing, good in everything or even in good in other people. You know, I'm sure you guys drive each other mad, right? And Not really, really. actually. <laughs> yeah. And well, quite often, if you're ever sort of, you know, niggling at each other, it's normally never the the fact that she borrowed your clothes and didn't return it properly or it's never that it's actually it's always other things mm -hmm. so it's um yeah but the gratefulness is massive yeah. yeah and it can just like it's something you can shift like i think i've woken up to this recently that like i just thought i was the way i was but once you start putting those practices into place and using the i am then it's you can actually change those things within yourself mm -hmm. you're not just like a negative person and there are those positive people and you're not one of them we can all be that yeah, totally. you, can. you can and you know what the other thing is we can all be negative right we've all had our moments where we've gone down that little spiral hole and gone you know poor me i didn't get that promotion or i didn't get this or that boyfriend should call me and he shouldn't like yeah we all do it right but um but you actually can actually you know ne neuroplasticity you can actually change the way you think mm. you, just because you're a negative person doesn't mean you have to be however i think people are sometimes born either positively biased or negatively biased mm. which is easier for the positively biased people mm. but do doesn't you, mean we can't all do it correct do you have um any like rituals you mentioned like a grateful ritual or like something a way that you start your day um look i start my day um i have a, a 11 year old daughter i start with my day sh with her running into my bedroom <laughs> and, and give me a hug you know, other than That's that, lovely. I know, it's nice, isn't it? So it's that, you know, I like to start with yoga, um, not every morning, but sometimes morning. Sometimes if I haven't got time for yoga, I'll do an eight-minute um, high-intensity workout. Um, eight minutes, love that. I know. Anyone, There's no excuses. Like, no one doesn't have eight minutes. You, you know what? That's the theory, right? So I tend to go, and sometimes I go, oh, I can't be bothered doing it, right? And I go, for God's sake, it's eight minutes, right? By the time yeah. I whinged about it and, and puffed and huffed, I could have had it done. Like, yeah. so totally. By the time you scrolled through Instagram, like, it was more than eight minutes anyway, so. So true. Mm. So true. Yeah, so cool. I mean, I would love, this is so great and we're already, like, covering so many things that I didn't even realize but we'd love to kind of take you back I guess to that moment where you've gone on all these travels and you've had so many wild adventures and then you're kind of back in Australia why did you decide to become an entrepreneur I know I don't think I've ever been an entrepreneur I think in actual fact I my view on entrepreneurs is they make terrible business people <laughs> terrible business people right the reason being is an entrepreneur does this. They go, I love my idea. I've got a great concept. Could be shoes, could be podcasts, could be anything, right? And you go, wow, that's really exciting. And then you go down that path because it's exciting. And then the hard stuff starts, right? You've got to go, oh, God, did you not trademark that? Oh, bloody hell. What about the accounting? Oh, God, you've got to really have to worry about that. And then you have to worry about IP and you have to worry about like, The list goes on. That's all the boring stuff. But oh, so boring. <laughs> but the entrepreneur goes... Oh, look, there's another shiny light over there. I'll go over there too. So a lot of, the, like a true business person has to stick at it, 
Mm. And that what's the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people. So am I an entrepreneur? I don't I think I'm more of an adventurer. Mm -hmm. I'm someone that sort of loves the adventure, but also have that ability to be able to stick at the, you know, get to love the boring stuff. Yeah, I love what you said there because um, it's something that we talk about too, that like there's no difference between, you know, our idea is no better than anyone else's. Like I think honestly what makes us good at what we do is we're so damn stubborn. Mm -hmm. So like if it didn't work that way, we're going to try it 16 different times to make it work until we find the right one. And that means that, you know, now seven years or whatever into it, we're still persevering. And it's not because we were any better than anyone else. It's just because we were more stubborn. Mm. And that's what it is. It's like you refuse to actually give up. Yeah. And what you said was really important. It's like you've got to get things wrong, mm. right? You've got to get it wrong. Without getting it wrong, you're not trying hard enough. You're not giving things a go to actually learn. So I think I sit where I am now and I think, and people say to me, well, tell me all the things that have gone wrong, right? I actually can't think of anything. Not because this hasn't gone wrong. I mean, shit, every day something goes wrong, right? Um, but it's because that all of those things that went wrong helped me put a system in place, helped me learn, helped me get to where I am today. So all those things that are so-called wrong end up being right. Mm. So when you were in the early days of Boost, you, I mean, you really foreshadowed that kind of health trend, you know, like you started a smoothie bar before. Now, you know, we all drink smoothies every day, but back then in 2000, it just wasn't the case. How did you kind of see that coming? Look, you know, there was two things that got me started at Boost, um, two key personality traits. The first one was um, naivety. Like I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. I was a nanny in France and a stewardess on a boat for God's sake, right? I'd never run a business. Um, and so I didn't know actually how, know it was how hard. The other thing I started because I wanted to have a balance. I had three children at home. The youngest one was seven months, like a baby in arms. And I wanted to have that flexibility. So I thought I didn't really want to go back to work again. So it was naivety that got me into it. But actually it was fear that got me, got me motivated because by the time I had started and we'd signed up the leases and got going, I couldn't get it. I couldn't fail. A bit like you guys, right? You go, right, that didn't work. Keep at it. That didn't work. Keep it. My theory was, unless I got a no, it was, it was a maybe. A maybe is a yes. Mm. So it was that sort of ad attitude that just meant you just kept going. And there was, like, you, you, you would relate to this. You know, there's days where every single phone call that comes through is a negative, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you go, oh, my God, this is – and then the next day or two days later – you get about five opportunities that you will blow your mind, right? Mm. And I always think that so those days, and they come in runs, and I always find, I don't know whether it's the moon in the wrong orbit or what <laughs> it is, but, you know, some days Mercury's you just, in retrograde. It must be. Yeah. Right? That motherly Mercury thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so sometimes you feel like putting the phone down, going to bed, and then just wake me in the morning when the moon's moved, right? Oh, so, yeah. So it's, but it's life. And I think that when things like that happen, you do sit and go, okay, that's okay, um, It'll, it'll swing back because you just, as you said, you just keep at it. Yeah. And I love what you said there about, you know, the naivety and that you didn't know how hard it was going into it because I think often people psych themselves out because they're like, oh, I don't know that much about this. Someone else knows way more than me. And then you'll share your idea with a few people and people who know things in inverted commas will be like, no, that's too hard because they've mm. been there and they've tried and it hasn't worked. But actually those are the people that, that sometimes you they know too much mm. and mm. you have to have that kind of innocence and just dive right into it not knowing what you're going to expect and that's when you kind of come up with boost yeah no you're a hundred percent right like if i went to i was too busy to network but if i went to someone who was in retail experienced retailer successful retailer and said to them look i want to open a shop that just sells drinks right nothing else and i want to open a hundred in four years he would have gone don't be so stupid. It will not work. It will mm -hmm. implode. It will fail. Mm. I think so without putting a and you and then in my head I would have gone, oh, it won't work, right? So I wouldn't have done it. And I think that's where the naivety and that simplicity comes in that you just because you don't put those barriers on you, you just do it. Something that that actually reminds me of is when we set out to create a shoe business, like our first thing was like, okay, let's just talk to a million like people who have been there, done that. And all of their response was like, that's so boring. Have you seen this really great thing called Shoes of Prey? It's like this nice, shiny new thing. They create custom-made shoes. Each one is different. You create them on your website. This is what you should be doing. And we were like, yeah, but people don't know what they want to wear. Like that. Like people come to us because they want us to tell them what to wear. Like that just doesn't seem like it fits. And we just keep kept hearing that time and time again. Shoes of Prey, Shoes of Prey, Shoes of Prey. That's what you should be doing. And we were just like, in our gut was like, nah. And now they've 
not around anymore. And Tubes <laughs> is. <so> yay <laughs> <Yeah>. us. <laughs> yeah, good. And look, the thing is, so people think that they want to do it, but the reality is. They don't want to, they don't know how, like smooth smoothies, right? I could say to them, come and make your own smoothies, right? Juice is okay. We all know it's not that hard, right? But they go, well, but no, you're the expert. You mm. tell us, mm. right? You guys, are, you know, like style is so subjective, but clearly your style is something that people like. So they're looking to you to go, tell us totally. what works. And so, yeah, so when Pete's Shoes of Prey happens, people look at it and go, oh, I don't know, what colour? Yeah. What if I don't like it? What if I, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's Like difficult. the smoothies, just tell us which one we should order. Exactly. Um, so when you were kind of that, I guess, like you described it as naive, like you've got three kids and you really want to like make your own life and make your own job. Um, what were those kind of like first steps that was it just like you – by yourself did you have a bit of a team around you what were those first few things that you did well you think back right back to where you started with your shoes right it started with you guys just going let's go you didn't have a team mm. it's just you guys right and same with me I didn't have a team I, I had a great Dane in the corner that sat at my feet that was probably the <laughs> most help I had and you literally just take every day at a time and you do your work to actually do whatever you need to achieve so I had stores I had to open and so I knew what I had to do to actually get them open and and then slow you, slowly you hire the right people and then slowly you fire the ones that don't work out and you eventually get a great team and blah, blah, blah. Then it just sort of unfolds. But it's every day waking up, moving it ahead. Mm. Even if it's by millimetres, as long as it's he- moving ahead. Yeah, and it's sometimes like, you know, we get caught up in like business plans and long-term plans, but it really is at the end of the day, like you've got to take it one day, day at a day. time and yeah. hustle every single day for what you want to be creating. Hustle every single day with the end in mind, right? What to, So with your shoes, right? So what do you want it to look like? You know, do you want it to be um, Australia-based? Do you want it to be overseas-based? World what? domination. Great. <laughs> world domination is cool, right? So if you've got the end in mind, you go, okay, well, if I'm going to go be world domination in my shoes, gee, have I got the trademark for that? Mm. right have I got the um, manufacturer right have I got the cost right have I got the way of connecting to people right so but because you've got you know it might be over here it could be a hag, a big hairy or day suit face goal or it could be you know something <laughs> r- relative at least close or relatively achievable um, as long as you've got in that mind you can get there yeah like kind of like your north star Correct. Yeah, yeah, have the overarching goal and then hustle every day for it. I think yeah. that's really good advice. And with whether it's um, the North Star or whatever those analogies are, you're heading in that direction. And even if the North Star is there and you're heading that way, you'll keep you know, moving you towards it. Yeah. Correct. Three steps forward, five steps back. Tomorrow's a new day. <laughs> so Boost Juice, I believe, achieved 95% brand awareness within five years. So can we assume that means 95% of people surveyed within five years would have been like, oh, yeah, I know what Boost is. Yeah, correct. So there's a number of ways of, of um, you know, testing it. So it's sort of prompted and unprompted. So to get a – because we had no money to market, right, zip. And back then, in fairness, there was no internet where you can get that big exposure quickly. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was PR. It was driving wheatgrass shops into radio station. It was, you know, dropping. Oh, the wheatgrass shots boost, like, invented that in Ugh, Australia. I disgusting. remember that was such a thing. Like, everyone's standing on Chapel Street doing them. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, we, you know, so you, you have to do the hard work. You've got to get out of the office and make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, for us, like, you know, with Tubes, we're kind of building our brand awareness at the moment, little by little. Um, and I guess, you know, within five years to have gone from just you, your great Dane and your idea um, to, you know, such an epic brand, um, you know, what it, is it just about the slow grind? And like sometimes, you know, being in it, you feel like, uh, am I moving the needle? You know, like yeah. What you'll find is you feel like you're doing heaps and heaps of work and you don't move the needle. But it's like meat into a grinder. Like if, if that's a, a saying. I, you know, probably even know what a grinder is, right? So it's something that in the olden days it was something that you put you you tie the this grinder to the table and you'd put meat in it and you'd actually turn the handle. And you would turn the handle and turn the handle and nothing would go out and you keep pushing meat into the top. It was like to make mince meat, right? And eventually stuff will come out if you put do enough stuff in there it will come out. And once it comes out it flows there's other things it's called tipping point it's all sorts of things so it's really just continuing to do a little things and then one thing will spark mm. and then once it sparks so what's your why is your shoes different so they're animal friendly yep um they're fashion forward and then we also love to support females in business so like our whole supply chain is run by women um and then we give a grant to other female entrepreneurs running businesses so we feel like 
uh, in and addition to me can i add they're really comfortable as well oh. that's they're like really the comfy. biggest thing is, is that, like, is that your we're shoes? both wearing them at the moment Comfort's yeah it's everything comfort is everything like it, having like something that's fashion forward but also comfortable is like so important do you know why that is because you open your wardrobe right and you might have those beautiful pink shoes or yellow shoes or whatever shoes that you loved in that shop that looked amazing on your feet but when you open the wardrobe and you go oh god i can't wear those like you will always lean towards com- well i do anyway well yeah, and we 100%. find that with customers like once they have one pair they have five they have 10 pairs you know because it's right. like I-, I don't want to be uncomfortable anymore no. like nobody has time for that no as long as they look good yeah exactly the cute, cute shoes yeah they're super cute and then yeah we try to build our values into everything that we do and that's where we feel like we really connect with customers you know like our the people that love us they love us because we have amazing products but also because like we really care and we stand for things and that's what that's where the synergy is yeah great yeah so you've been a leader in marketing you know kind of throughout the whole of boost um one thing that came up when we were chatting was the like what's your name game where like you know on the radio they would say someone's name in the morning and if that was your name you could go and you could get a free boost um is that does that come from you like is that what you're really passionate about yeah correct look it's you know it's about generosity my theory at the start was my product is so good that once you taste it, you will come back, right? So I felt that whenever I gave a free smoothie away, I thought that 10 people would come back to me. And so it was that sort of generous theory of, um, or generous view that actually made the customers come back. If we get we stuff off an order, we'll give you a free one. You know, if um, What's Your Name Game was a really interesting eye-opener for us and a great brand builder because if your name was Peter, right? It wasn't just Peter that got a smoothie. Peter got 45 texts going, mate, get into booze, get into booze. So oh, people, so true. So people, so people felt like they were giving Peter a gift by just letting him know he gets a free one. So it was this big um, social push that actually really drove awareness. Yeah, that's so clever. And then when, you know, people are kind of looking at like their marketing calendars now and where they're going to invest their dollars and also their energy, I guess like so much for people, what comes up now is like social media marketing, like that's where you need to spend your money. Do you feel like that's cor- that's a, a, a good way of looking at it or do you feel like these more like innovative ways of marketing is the way to go? Look, marketing is really simple, right? Find out what your customer wants and give it to them also find out where they are and show them so for example if you go all right so where is our cut our say our 27 year old bullseye female bullseye well she's on outdoor so she might be on tram she might be on train so you go okay there's an element that you need to think about with regard to top line but but she's also on her phone but then that is also a hit and miss and there is it's so um, crowded and you know people don't want things shoved in their face uh, so you know AI is helping with that so in actual fact I won't get a car ad or I won't get a you know um, rectal dysfunction ad to me you know <laughs> you know hopefully I'll get the information that I want to get or the things I want to get so AI helps but it is still a ridiculously crowded market out there in 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 advertising and marketing and it yes It's still easier to now track if people do open it, if they like it, they forward it, they interact with it. So it's a little bit more, uh, what's the word, more measurable Mm -hmm. than it it probably was to go, yes, there's a magazine. Well, did you look at it? Did you read it? Did you do anything with it? Did you, yeah. So it's, it's but you can't ignore either. I think that both of them as a combination works really well, Mm. not one on its own. I love that you just said marketing is simple. Like you were just like, oh yeah, no, that's the easy part. Like I got this. Um, but I think what you said there about finding out what customers want is so true and such great advice and seems so simple, but people don't. And I think Shoes of Prey is a perfect example where they thought they knew what customers want and maybe they did a survey, but you need to actually go out there and find out what do customers really want yeah. and spend time with them and test products on them um, and really do your research in that way. And then the other thing that you said was just really like, you know, using that data that you get and like measuring that at the end of the day, like it's not just like a print magazine now where we, you know, we don't know what area of it they read. You can see exactly where someone clicked on something on your ADM, yeah. what button they, like what color button they clicked on and really using that data to better your yeah, way correct. of doing things. And look, it's interesting because you've got to listen to the, you've got to listen to your consumer, right? But you've also got to have your own creative intuition like for example henry ford right said if i asked the customers what they wanted they would have said they wanted faster horses right he invented the car right Mm, so that gives me chills (laughs) that is such a good one right so you've got to so you've got to make sure that 
you know, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, it's these people that have this amazing vision of what can, can happen. You know, Facebook, you know, all of these things, people wouldn't have gone, oh, I want a phone that can blah, 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 blah. They wouldn't even thought about it because they wouldn't have thought their brain could have comprehended what it could possibly be. Hmm. So in some respects, you've got to give it a go. So I actually read your book, um, The Secrets of My Success, years ago. It makes me think of Hawaii poolside when I think of that book because that's where I was reading it. Um, <laughs> and something that really stuck with me, like I, I, you know, I don't know when that book came out, but this, you know, years later, really, like I think about it all the time when we're in a meeting is that I think someone else in your book was talking about how you were the kind of person that like even you went, if you went into a room and – you didn't know the most in the room and someone was talking about something they were an expert in, you would come into that room with no ego and you would just ask all the right questions and you would gather all the knowledge and by the end of it, you'd just, you'd have it and you'd have that room and you'd know exactly what was going on. Do you remember that? No, I don't. But, <laughs> it, but does that sound like you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's a secret of listening. Like I don't have all the answers, right? And I'm hoping the people in the room have come from different experience, different knowledge and, you know, they're in the room because they're, you know, smart people that have got something to contribute. So what tends to happen as leaders is we come in and go, right, I'll give you my opinion. Now what's everyone else's opinion? And people go, oh, my God, they have that opinion and they, they're going to mirror that opinion, mm. right, instead of actually giving their own opinion. Yeah. And so I think it's, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, you feel like you haven't got time and you just need to get to the point. But really that ability to listen is um, is, is very powerful. Yeah, but that's almost like a superpower that you have that I feel like so many people are like, like I know when sometimes when I'm in a room of what I feel like is really smart people and I'm the dumbest one there, I'm like, shit, I need to make up for it. I'm so insecure about how dumb I am, you know, like and like that just like talking starts to happen inside yeah. your head. Like how do you how did you kind of come to that? Like how do you deal with that inside of you or is, oh, look, does it exist? No one wants to look stupid, right? And, you know, sometimes I sit there and go, and quite often, like, if you came into my business, right, and you, we would say, now, there's Ben, Bart, FBC, CRMs, they would throw all these acronyms at you, right, and go, hey, so sorry, what the hell does that mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what does that term mean? Or what, and that's okay. You know, I, um, and I think age means that you feel a little bit more comfortable in your skin. Mm. I used to pay lawyers, and I still pay lawyers, a fortune every hour, and I used to hate it. So what I thought was with in front of a lawyer, I thought instead of actually um, paying them for that hour, why don't I pay them for the work plus the knowledge? So I would sit there, I would get a contract, I would read the whole contract, one of those rare people that read contracts, and I would circle anything I didn't understand. And I didn't care if they felt I was stupid or not because my theory was if I had more knowledge and more understanding, then the next time I had a contract, then one, I'd understand it, and two, maybe I could only use it for an hour instead of three hours. Mm. So I actually got to a point where, you know what, if you think I'm stupid, well, that's your issue. Mm. So I think it's just... I love that point. attitude. Yeah, that's great. Just comfortable in your own skin. Yeah, we would have that when we were first meeting with retailers to talk about stocking tubes. And I remember that we would like come into it and pretend that we knew everything because like we didn't want to come off as stupid. Yeah, like we didn't want them to know that they were the first retailer that was ever going to buy us. <laughs> and now when we go back to retailers years later when we've had a lot more experience, I realize that, like, you know, I find us going, oh, sorry, um, we don't actually know what that term means. Do you mind repeating that or do you mind explaining that? And you realize that, like, no one once cares. you are comfortable nah, with... no one cares. Yeah, exactly. No one cares. And once you are comfortable with the amount of knowledge you have, you're free to ask those questions because, yeah. like, why not? Like, you're not... You're never going to know it unless you ask those questions. No, you're so right. Yeah. You're so right. So what kind of, like, in addition to being self-aware and kind of, I guess, knowing your strengths and your weaknesses, what other qualities do you feel like makes for a successful person um i think um you know as i said before you know that ability to listen um, that ability to create systems that ability to have a clear vision and then a system to be able to follow up yeah you know, it's all very well for you guys to go right we're going to do this and if you don't follow up and you make sure that you know exactly what's going on and keep people accountable mm. then you, you you move into chaos pretty quick I feel like we're definitely guilty of doing that. Like we come up with like really big picture stuff and then like next week we're like, oops, we forgot to do all of that. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, going easy on yourself is important as well. Like there's only yeah. so much you can kind of put your time towards. True. Yeah. I think that's the other thing is be kind to yourself. Hmm. I think we are quite um, tough on ourselves with regard to what we want to achieve. And I think it's good to actually then look at ourselves uh, you know, and go, okay, stuff that one up. How am I going to make it up? Like hmm. I think it's good to be accountable 
But it's also good to be kind. Like I am. Are you, have you got kids? Nope. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> we have furry babies. Furry, furry babies. babies? What sort of dogs? Uh, I have a golden retriever and Jess has a... I have a cat. A white cat. A white cat. Nice. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I have dogs um, and horses and goats. Do you? Oh, you oh, have, oh we, we, we saw that you have, have goats. goats. I know, it's stupid having goats. But anyway. <laughs> um, they look so cute. I know, they are. They are. Do you want them? <laughs> kind <Maybe>. of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't have, don't have um, what is it, the roses. They kill up the roses. Um, <laughs> yeah, so look, I think... Um, I think, I don't know, I've completely I've gone into my goats and my mind's gone back to goats. Goats. Same. Goats are great. I think we're talking about being kind to yourself. Yeah. So back to the kids, right? So I think as a young mum of three kids, I never sort of got myself, I didn't buy into that parent guilt. I just sort of went, you know what? They're fine. They've got a few issues. There's therapy. They'll be fine. That's great. That's a good attitude. <laughs> don't sweat the small stuff. Exactly. Um, so we obviously like we had a lot to ask you about today, but could not have you here right now without chatting Survivor. Exactly. Yes. So yeah, awesome. Absolutely. How's it going? So I feel like it's weird that you're here because you're also in the jungle. I know. Like, I mean, how much fatter am I am here than I am in there? <laughs> I mean, no, you look amazing. You're well, still tanned. I know. Probably, and I think it's still from Fiji. Um, the oh look, it was insane. It was the worst and the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. Like it was. It's hysterical to watch it. And I must admit, I just look at myself and go, Oh my god, you're so. Scared. Skinny. <laughs> like, oh, like, Everyone is in the jungle. So yeah, exactly. That's okay. How long ago was it? Uh, it was about six weeks, eight weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, so ah. it was really recent. Yeah, yeah. Oh really my god. Yeah. Oh, so so you don't was... have any PTSD or anything. Oh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah. It just hasn't come up yet. Yeah. No, I'm sure it's coming. Yeah. Um, look, it was. Yeah, but it really is as as real as you see. You know, people think that. Oh, surely you give you. Yeah. You know, surely they give you something like nah. There's literally a bit of dirt. And there's a couple of, you know, poles over there, which is bamboo that they've sort of in the jungle. And, you know, there's a machete and there's a pot. Good luck, honey. And oh, you, you literally have to sort everything out yourself. And what made you want to do that? Like you have so much else going on in your life. And then when we first heard Janine on Survivor, we were like, what? And then we watch you and we're like, okay, yeah, we totally get this. Like you were kind of made for this. But what was the driver to make you want to do it? How could you not? Like, how can you not, if someone says to you, right, because you have, right, you, you know what happens, we get up in the morning, we get a coffee or tea, we do our things, we have a routine, we go to bed, right? And the next day it starts, we do the similar thing, right? So how can you not, if someone says to you, would you like to do something extraordinary, it will test you, it will make you happy, it will make you sad, it will make you, um, you know, all of these things, how can you say no to an experience like that? And not only that, it was January when they asked me. And I, I do I do this thing with my girlfriends. We um we every year we do five things that we're going to do professionally, mentally, and physically to ourselves, right? For ourselves, tips, you know, or goals, right? Goals. And you get together and discuss them. And over a glass of wine, we roll them up, put in the bottle of wine, and then we take the bottle of wine a year later. We start again, right? Oh, oh my that's god, amazing. that is so good. And so, literally, I was running late as I was, and I wrote down my goals. And my goals were um, to challenge myself to do something completely different. To, um, and I'm a bit of a hermit, so I thought, okay, I'm going to get out there and meet new people, right? And I said, I want something to scare myself. And, and then over summer, I chucked on a couple of kilos, right? So I went, okay, I want to shove those couple of kilos, right? So literally I had this list in my hand as I was running out and the producer of Survivor called and said, do you want to do it? And I kind of no. went, oh, my God, oh. I have to. <gasps> and I remember saying to her, look, I'm a probably – she said – actually the conversation went like this. I know you're going to say no, right? And I know you're going to say no. I'm going, what? no to what, right? And she kept going, going, going. And she said, but would you do survive? And I went, oh, my God, I'm a probable yes. And then I said. I have chills. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said to my daughter, I said, look, I've got some good news and bad news. And she said, what? And I said, look, I might be, have to be away for about eight weeks. And she went, you cannot go, right? No, my, my sons wouldn't even know I'd left, right? And um, you can't go. And I said, look, it's Survivor. She said, I'll pack your bag, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it was one of those things that by the time I got the go-ahead with my family, because, you know, obviously it's a big deal to, you know, leave your family for 55 days by the time you're there and back. Um, you know, I had no other choice but to do it. But, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was horrible and it was great. Mm. What did you do to prepare for it? Because I was fascinated when I was reading about that. I was like, oh, of course, this woman's so successful. She yeah. just did all the things to prepare. <laughs> well, look, you know, what drove me was fear, right? I went there and going, shit, you know, I'm over 50, right? So I'm not a spring chicken. I knew there was going to be athletes there, probably some Olympic athletes, right? 
And I thought, for me to win this or get to the end, I can't be the weakest, I can't be the strongest, I've got to sit in the middle. So for me, I set up a, uh, my, I do yoga anyway, so I was relatively strong. Um, and I, so I did my eight minute routine. I did my, I swam, I, so I got myself to, into pretty good shape. But then I went, okay, so I know that they won't let you any, any wet weather gear. So I studied materials. What materials can I go in with? Because they say you only can have a limited amount of clothes that you actually are literally wearing. So I studied, you know, so silk and merino wool were the things that actually breathe, dry the quickest, keeps you warm even when wet, blah, blah, blah. And then I went, okay, that's, that's fine. I Googled how to freaking cope in a coconut, how to make fire, how to do everything. But I thought, but I felt for myself that I couldn't, there's not, it's all very well watching in Google, but you really need to get there. So I arrived 24 hours before someone else and I hired a local villager. And I, oh got, and I got him to, I went to his village and we, we sat down and we weaved and we, um, we made, co- we, he helped me show me how to open a coconut and what you can do with the coconut. And then he showed me how to make fire and help show me how to build a shelter and, and so, yeah, so, so I felt like hand on heart that I, there was nothing more I could physically do mm. to be prepared. And even then I wasn't prepared. But then I actually was really shocked because I got there, right? And say, and people didn't even think about the stuff I thought about. Like they came in, some of them came in in T-shirts and shorts. Mm. And you're like, have you not seen Survivor and seen them shivering, cuddling each other? I don't think they like themselves that much. I think they're just cold. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I was perplexed as to how little preparation people did. Yeah, but you kind of just like went about it like as if it was like a job or a business. Like you did like full, full recon, which is so yeah. clever. And like, yeah, it seems obvious to you, but for m- most, I'm sure it wasn't. And maybe because I'm older and I've lived a life of, getting it wrong so I go okay I do not like to be cold right and so for me to go in there I did not want to be cold but yeah. it looked cold it was freezing yeah right particularly that last gasp thing oh my god seriously I mean they didn't show how actually everyone was shivering uncontrollably there was no fun in there I actually remember standing there going I wonder if I did a run of that notice <laughs> <laughs> I think they would <laughs> but you know like you some of the challenges you rock up and you go oh my god today's the day I'm gonna die right mm. it was some of the challenges what off the charts scary and then you go oh my god i'm not doing that i'm not doing that and they go go and you go okay and you just do it like and i so i think that ability to feel like you can do more than what you're capable of yeah. was actually quite you know really blew your mind amazing and i'm sure it made you appreciate everything here so much as well yeah when you go back to you know the, the start of our conversation which is gratefulness you really did discover gratefulness you know you gr- you're grateful for the sunrise and it wasn't raining you're grateful for um, friendships you're grateful for food you're grateful for flavor you're grateful for a roof that didn't leak you know you were grateful for um, you know people that had your back you know so it was it was a long list of things grateful for I was grateful for no internet and digital mm. because oh. I could sit in front and actually have a conversation without someone buzzing and and you know and getting vibrating. distracted yeah we all have such short yeah. attention spans now and the relationships you have for people because you've got nothing else to do but talk to them because I actually thought going in I thought that would I thought being cold and being bored would have driven me mad like because I, I like busy right? mm. I like to be busy and to be able to get there and actually just be happy to sit with someone and just talk about anything was great and obviously my buddy in there was Pia I don't know if you're watching the show yeah mm, yeah so and we love Pia like looking for our Randy like it was the best oh yeah so she's I mean I saw her yesterday so she's she was just you know we were each other's buddies you know she um we slept together every night in each other's arms because it was so freaking cold mm. we actually got to a point where we could at two o'clock we'd sort of wake up and we'd all both turn because you the space you you know the two of us were sleeping in a space like this big yeah on the ground like and, you know, then, it, yeah, so it was, you, it was really that, you know, very, you know, sort of intimate closeness that you develop where you can't develop anywhere else. So yeah, you think like that a friendship, lifetime bond. Yeah, exactly. Is that going to last? Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. I think the key things is we have daughters similar age. They're now best mates. Oh, uh, so cute. You know, she's a, um, she's into yoga. I'm into yoga. You know, I would probably at very, rarely a day would go by that we're not texting. You know, as I said, we did yoga yesterday and had lunch. You know, so. So nice amazing all right well janine this has been so incredible um thank you so much it's just like such cool timing for us to be able to sit down and have this chat with you and just know everybody listening is just going to be like on your every word um we do always wrap up with some quick fires so we'll go for those awesome um what's your smoothie order ah i like pure eden okay what's in it 
uh, God, it's there's about five hundred ingredients. Okay. Um, there, it's all greens. So mm-hmm. there's spinach, there's cucumber, there's there's grapes, there is lemon, there is pineapple, there is all sorts of stuff. Yeah, it sounds delicious. I'm all about mango magic. I That's was thinking good. about it like since I was like fifteen. Like every you day I used mango to magic. when I was at uni, every day I would get a donut and a mango magic. And yeah, I was like, oh, so good. <laughs> it's like kind of healthy and kind of not. So it's good. Um, so how many goats do you have? Two, That's and the the names are cotton candy, cotton, cotton and candy. candy. Yeah, oh, adorable. That is so cute. They sound delicious. Um, who inspires you? Oh God, you? do you eat goat? <laughs> no, oh. no, I'm vegetarian. <laughs> like delicious to cuddle oh. and kiss. Okay, just check. <laughs> Okay. Hey, some vegan shoe label. Vegan shoe label. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Um. Yeah. Next question. Who inspires you? Um. This inspiration comes from everywhere. You know. I think people tend to, um, tend to just think that inspiration has to come from someone older than them or, or more mature. But you know, like actually, one of the things that did inspire me on Survivor was Pia. You know, she is five foot two. Right. Some of the challenges were real. A real challenge for you know people that are five foot two and her determination just to keep going was amazing uh, roscoe on there he inspired me to learn that you never lose a child in, in, in no matter how old you get you know luke inspired me because so to, despite the fact that he's got you know six kids sick kids and he's the most positive person on the planet david you know inspired me because he made me laugh mm. you know and he was evil, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's um, inspiration. You just need to open your eyes and ears and inspiration comes from everywhere. Mm. Love, love that. that. I feel like that would have been a really nice one to end on. But what is your go-to meal to make at home? Uh, you know, I, I love, I, I'm a firm believer on sleep is the most important thing you can do to your body and keep you healthy. And so I don't like to eat heavy meals at night. I t- tend to sort of stick with soup. Mm. So, you know. What about, was there a first thing you ate when you got out? Oh, God. Was there something you were, like, dying for? I think it was a cherry ripe. Yeah. I think, no, I know, because I think what happened is, right, so, you know, you go, right, so if, if, if you, because you guys are vegan, right, you understand you have to really know how, you, how to eat, right? So we basically fasted for 50 days. Mm. And you get out of this, get out of Survivor, and you think there's be nutritionists to go, okay, we're going to sort of get you in nice and slowly. Nah, here is a basket full of absolute crappy food, and you <laughs> just open your mouth and hoover it. Right, so yeah, so I think it was a cherry ripe or, or a crunchy was okay. the first thing I ate when I got out, and I'm <laughs> sure it would have tasted amazing. Oh, it was amazing! Yeah, amazing. Uh, last one. How would your children describe you? Oh God, um, it depends on the child. <laughs> <laughs> your uh, favorite one? <laughs> my favorite one. She would the just, daughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, she look. She would definitely describe me. Oh no, she, uh, she would describe me as her mum. You know, it's probably only... That is such a nice answer. <laughs> That's so sweet. Yeah. And the others, who knows? I mean, it depends on the day. It depends if, you know, I'm giving them what they want. They'll love me. If not, they don't. Yeah. So yeah, to Australia, do. you're, you know, this amazing, successful entrepreneur and survivor and shark tank. But to your daughter, you're just mum. I love yeah, it. Yeah, correct. I think the boys are interesting because they're a bit older. And I think through business, they haven't really given me any credit. But I think seeing me on Survivor I, th- I think I finally got some family cred you got the straight cred finally <laughs> after <laughs> all that work over the years yeah. that eight weeks in the jungle just like done it's all it took and I think that's it I think that's exactly right yeah that's really funny <laughs> awesome. okay awesome well thank you thank so you much, so much and good luck we're rooting for you good no thank you thank you it's awesome. gonna be some exciting stuff ahead